Now I'm going to have to do something that's even harder than operating on the cavernous sinus, and that is to try and summarize uh, Professor Gold's extensive experience. Uh, so this is even harder than trying to operate the cavernous sinus. At all, I hope I'm going to miss a lot of things out. I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, now, <laughs> Professor Gold, of course, is the professor and head of department at the King Edward uh, Memorial Hospital and Seth G S um, Medical College. He's a consultant at the uh, Tata Memorial Hospital and Cancer Research Institute. He's the editor-in-chief of multiple journals. He's got over 650 publications. Uh, but I think more importantly, he is a very, very experienced neurosurgeon who has published some landmark papers for key aspects of neurosurgery, including the cavernous sinus. Uh, he really understands the technique and that's published a lot of the uh, work that we've all, we've all read. So it's, it's a real pleasure to introduce Atul, who I'm sure will give us an absolutely fantastic lecture with his huge experience. Atul, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sanjeeva. And uh, it is my great pleasure and great honor to be a part of this show. And for next 90 minutes, fasten your seat belts and strit, sit straight and sit tight. Cavernous sinus is a really a complex issue. And I have spent a lifetime on cavernous sinus. And I must say, I have enjoyed this life in a very fascinating manner. Difficult, but wonderful and beautiful. So what I'm going to do for the next 90 minutes is to share with you my journey on this great subject of cavernous sinus. I must say that cavernous sinus surgery was born in the era of MRI. Before MRI, which was introduced in neurosurgery latter half of 1980s, cavernous sinus surgery was quite, quite in a primitive fashion. But after MRI has been introduced, cavernous sinus surgery is really come into form. As has been discussed, there is no question that we have to learn the anatomy, we have to understand the various intricacies of presence of dura, presence of nerves, and presence of carotid artery. It is not easy. It is not a game where you can do without doing any dissections. It is not a game without understanding the whole issue. It is a wonderful subject. And if you know it, you can actually give new life. So what I intend to do is, I want to show how cavernous sinus surgery can be done easily this easily word is in inverted commas. In 1996, I wrote this book on cavernous sinus and on various complex tumors and vascular lesions. You can imagine in 1996, you see this dissection which is done here, the whole pitocectomy has been done, carotid arteries mobilized, cavernous sinus, gasserin ganglion is mobilized, seven nerve is mobilized, and you are seeing the entire view of Petrus apex, clivus, and posterior cavernous sinus. So this was the way I worked during those times. Of course, I have certainly matured from this kind of dissection to a different world of cavernous sinus and skull base. So I want to show you. And I want to show you some philosophical issues. Alam al-Dimag is a word from Arabic legacy. And no one in the world of Arabic world or in any neurosurgical world has ever extracted this word from Arabic legacy. It means the meninges are the mother of brain. This is a very huge sentence in my own life and in my several articles that have been published on this subject. Dura is durable. This is the key word in my lifetime with neurosurgery and I'm going to share this key word on multiple occasions in my lecture. Dura is a very 
firm and compact membrane. There are no holes in the dura. It is like folded membrane. The nerves go never through the hole in the membrane. It goes along the membrane and that will, I will also discuss. This compact dural membrane, this compact fort divides the spiritual brain, the most sterile organ of our body from the outside world. It does not let any organisms in the paranasal sinus or in the oral mucosa even touch this beautiful brain. So this dura is a divine structure and you must remember that whilst operating, we must respect the dura because more importantly, the tumors respect the dura and how the tumors respect the dura will be the subject of my lecture. During my journey of last 35 years with cavernous sinus, I have written several philosophical papers on this, on speculations about cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus, its role in eye movements and in eye health, maternalizing the cavernous sinus, ocularizing the cavernous sinus, and so on and so forth. I have discussed in my journey of last 35 years on cavernous sinus as to why the cavernous sinus is so intimately related to the pituitary gland, why the cavernous sinus is so intimately related to the sphenoid sinus, and why cavernous sinus is so intimately related to the internal carotid artery. Why the pituitary gland is neither intracranial nor extracranial, is this location of pituitary gland, which is neither intracranial nor extracranial, in close vicinity to cavernous sinus and close vicinity to sphenoid sinus, is this an anatomical error or is it a functional necessity? So I will be discussing these things. So there are several articles of mine on philosophical issues of cavernous sinus and I am putting those on the screen and they will be on the YouTube and you must go and watch. And if you have uh, interest in these kind of speculations, you must read many of these articles. These are the only two articles in the history of neurosurgery, which mention that there is some role of cavernous sinus. Cavernous sinus itself plays a role these are the only two articles written in 1976. These articles mention that it has some ro role in cerebral blood flow and in heat maintenance of the body. Cavernous sinus plays a role. So these are the only two, uh, two functions that cavernous sinus may be performing. So in these articles, I have written about what additional things cavernous sinus can be performing. So whatever nature does, even this fetal position has some role. It is, I call it, you know, when there is a flight and you have some flight turbulence or something like that, the, the air hostess says brace position. So this is the brace position of the fetus. So everything has a role to play. So there is no, nothing without any role. So this is the astronaut and it is flying in the space. And this is the amnionaut. I call this fetus amnionaut and it is floating in amniotic fluid. So if you ask me what is the role of amniotic fluid, it is most important role is to make the fetus weightless and let, let the pregnant lady do her function till the end of the fetal life. Similarly, if you ask me what is the function of CSF, it makes the brain weightless. It is such an important function of CSS, never described in the literature before, that CSF has major role in making the brain weightless. This is the brain and it is floating in CSF it makes the brain weightless. And C brain is floating in CSF, does not touch the floor because of CSF and because of the blood in cavernous sinus. Both these things 
help to make the brain weightless. Of course, there are too many issues in this. I don't want to go in too much detail, but I will invite you to read many articles of mine where I have said the functions of fluid is to make the whole human body weightless and make it mobile. And when you run, it is on fluids. When you sit, it is on fluid. When you stand, it is on fluid. So I like to label cavernous sinus as a cavernous vena magna. So it is the largest venous plexus in the human body. And it is, has a great role in eye movements and protection of the eyeball. Eyeball is a hydrodynamic wonder of the body. If there is any excessive pressure on the eyeball in the vitreous humor and aqueous humor, which is a fluid-based hydrodynamic system, the lens is fluid-based, any pressure which is more than normal will not let it function. The lens will not be able to function, the retina will not be able to function, and the most noble organ cannot function if the hydrodynamic system of the eyeball is not functioning properly. And in my articles on the subject, I have said that the cavernous sinus has a great role to play in pursuing, in preserving the hydrodynamics of the eyeball. So there is this eyeball, behind the eyeball is a non-compressible fat and a huge plexus of venous plexus behind the eyeball. And this relates the pressure to the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus, when the eye moves, the, it relates the movement to the cavernous sinus. So there is, this is the eyeball. If you press the eyeball, the pressure goes behind and it relates to the contralateral eyeball through the intercavernous sinus. There is diplopia for some time and then the diplopia settles. So this intercavernous sinuses have a great role to play and cavernous sinus has a great role to play. I like to label cavernous sinus as venous chiasma. So if you press on the eyeball, the thin retinal artery, which has no muscular layer, will immediately rupture. As soon as you press the eye, the cavern, the retinal artery will rupture. It is because of the pressure transmission to the contralateral eye and to the cavernous sinus that the, that the eyeball is sustained, able to sustain the function and to maintain the function. Imagine when the cavernous sinus gets thrombosed, there is no problem with the venous, no problem with the nerves, but the whole eye movements are lost. In advanced stages, even the vision is lost. So in one of my beautiful articles on, my, on this subject, I said that the cavernous sinus has a role to play in eye movements and in the vision. Imagine when, you, when this gentleman lifts up such a heavy weight, the jugular vein is bloated, but nothing happens to the eyeball. I have said in my article that this cavernous sinus has the capacity to, as a sump or a neutralizing effect. So I like to label cavernous sinus as ocular Pascalian stability assuring system or a sump and a venous lake which neutralizes the pressure. So this is the circle of Willis we have all seen, but we don't name, but we have seen a circle which I call as cavernous sinus. So cavernous sinus, without any doubt in your mind, you must know cavernous sinus has a great role in eye movement and in vision. Why the cavernous sinus in the deer is larger than the cavernous sinus in lion. This is my favorite slides, uh, slide, and I have shown it not less than 200 times in my various lectures. So when the deer runs, it looks in front, it looks behind, and the eyeball moves continuously in a very rapid manner so that it can run and jump, and simultaneously it can see the lion which is following and trying to hunt this and about to hit on the back and on the neck 
So these eye movements are very rapid and because rapid movements, the cavernous sinus is much bigger in, in a deer than in a lion, which has to just look in front and jump and attack. It is not bothered about what is happening behind or any mosquito or anything is coming to bite from behind. It has to just look in front. The line of vision is only 30 degrees in a lion. And in a, in a deer, it is 180 degrees. In a human body, it is 70 degrees. This is the cavernous sinus of a monkey and a cavernous sinus of a human being. Cavernous sinus of a fish is much bigger. This Hakuba has said, and even the fat content in cavernous the swimming and also the balance and also the vision. So more the function of cavernous sinus, more the eye movements, cavernous sinus, lies behind the eye. What is beautiful is the eye, of course, but what lies behind the eye is more beautiful. And you see the eyes of several animals and you see some beautiful eyes. <clears throat> the relationship <clears throat> of cavernous sinus with the sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus, the nasal mucosa, the oral mucosa are the most vascular structures of the body. <clears throat> as soon as the air goes inside the nose, it is hot or cold in the nose, but as soon as it goes in the trachea, it is normal temperature. Yeah. The temperature of the food, whether it is hot or cold, is hot in the mouth, but as soon as it goes in the mouth, beyond the mouth, it is normal temperature. Mucosa changes the temperature of these structures, and mucosa gives information to the cavernous sinus, to the carotid artery, to the pituitary gland, and this master gland regulates the whole body system. So this relationship has a great influence in the formation of the body and functioning of the body. One article by Vinko Dolans that carotid artery goes in these turns and these turns can make actually this kind of curvature can influence the temperature of the carotid artery and of the cavernous sinus. So cavernous itself is makes the thing very strong. Cavernous, the plexus makes the venous plexus strong like a, this hand. Then there are several articles of mine that are based on anatomical information, extradural approach, <clears throat> which I described for the tumors for the first time in the literature. And there are several other articles which I will be discussing as we go further in our discussion. And there are several articles, most of the articles, I must say, are based on the dura and how the tumors respect the dura and how the surgeon should respect the dura during the operative endeavor. And if you respect the dura, if you understand the dural relationship, Believe me, the whole world of cavernous sinus can be made rather simple and rather straightforward. And this is what I'm going to show you. I'm putting this list of these articles for you to have a list when you, if you have interest to go further in this subject. Membranes are the mother and that forms the basis. So, <clears throat> Many of my articles are published before 95, before 92, 93, in those days when cavernous sinus surgery was not actually very popular and very few people in the world were doing cavernous sinus surgery. Of course, we know the work of Vinko Dolens in the cavernous sinus, and he was the first one to show extradural approach to aneurysms and vascular lesions around the cavernous sinus and also to trigeminal schwannomas extradural. So Vinko Dolan's work we respect and he is my very good friend and a, no question he's my hero in cavernous sinus surgery. But what I'm going to show you is my work and my contributions to this subject and my several articles in the field of cavernous sinus. Most important is we must remember that the soft tissue is important. We must learn to respect the soft tissue in this fetus. There is not a spicula bone. It is all soft tissue and all everything is there in this fetus, not a spicula bone. Mandibular nerves goes into the foramen ovale. 
it is the mandibular nerve which is formed first, foramen ovale comes later. Mandibular nerve does not pass through foramen ovale. It is foramen ovale or the bone formation which comes afterwards. So bone is an afterthought in the nature. You must remember bone is the weakest part of the human body. Membranes are the strongest part of the body. So my experience in 1993, I did this case. You can imagine 1993 during that time, nobody knew cavernous sinus and this patient of mine is still alive after so many years of surgery. This is another tumor I did long time ago. This patient, beautiful operation in 1995, 25 years ago, this patient never came for follow-up. After four or five years, he used to come, but never afterwards. This is another anterior clinoid meningioma involving the cavernous sinus, small residue, whether you will like to give radiation or not radiation. Those issues have arisen or arrived in the horizons recently, but they were not such important issues during those times. This is another very memorable case of mine. One tumor behind the orbit, one tumor in the, inside the cavernous sinus, and this patient was almost landing for removal of the eyeball when it landed to me. And a very vascular tumor, so we removed the retroorbital tumor first and then the cavernous sinus tumor. Both these tumors, you know, this was hemangiopericytoma, this was a schonoma. Both these tumors, complete removal and a very effective long term outcome. So this patient is with me for 25 years now without any major symptom and without any recurrence. So cavernous sinus surgery has to be learned. It has to be effectively performed and you have to make it look simple. So this is my article which was published in the year 1997, which described extra dural approach to tumors involving the cavernous sinus. This was the first article in Medline and in PubMed, intracavernous sinus tumors by an extradural operation, uh, extradural approach. Learning and understanding the extradural approach and entering into the cavernous sinus, Vinko Dolenz of course did vascular lesions and also he described this approach for trigeminal schonomas, which I will go further and show my contributions in trigeminal schonomas. So this article I wrote in 1998, which is heavily cited article in the literature where I said cavernous sinus surgery, internal carotid artery relationship can determine the pathology of the tumor and your surgical strategy. Here the artery is squeezed by the tumor, here artery is encased but not squeezed by the tumor, here the artery is displaced by the tumor and these relationships can give you an information as to how to operate on this tumor. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> one of the most dangerous and most vascular tumors of the body. I am not sure if you can interpret what is this tumor. I don't have time, but I could have waited. This is cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus. <clears throat> this is the most benign tumor of the body, of the cavernous sinus. This tumor is the most difficult neurosurgical tumor. It is a very heavily vascular tumor. More important is that it is entirely within the confines of the cavernous sinus. Never it goes outside the dura of the cavernous sinus. In 1991, this was the case I published with pre-op and post-operative image of this tumor. Before this, 1991, there were very, very few reports, if at all, showing pre-operative and post-operative images of cavernous hemangioma surgery. So lateral wall is intact. The tumor goes towards the intercavernous sinus, goes towards the orbit, goes towards the Meckel cave. Never this integrity is destroyed. It encases the internal carotid artery. No matter how big it becomes, no matter, the dura will remain intact. Intercavernous sinus extension will always be there the cavernous extension towards the Meckel case, towards the orbit, internal carotid arteries encased by this tumor, the sixth nerve is encased by the tumor, that makes the surgery difficult and complex. 
So we described in the year 2000, my experience with 13 cases, which was very large experience at that time. Now my experience is 38 cases with cavernous hemangioma. For the first time in the literature, we described an extra dural approach to these tumors, extra dural. And subsequently several groups had described, but this was the first article described in the literature where an extra dural approach to cavernous hemangioma was described. And no question, the whole world now likes to do extra dural approach for these tumors. So this is the tumor and uh, this is the extra dural operation. And this is the only, there is no other treatment. You have to do surgery. If you have to restore the eye movements and the ptosis after three months of surgery, the eye movements have returned and you can bring a beautiful smile on this lady. Only one strategy of treatment is that you have to resect it radically and you have to resect it completely. No matter how big this tumor becomes, it encases the internal carotid artery, the tumor extends towards the intercavernous sinus, and this is the flow-related aneurysm, very heavily vascular tumor. If you have the guts, if you know how to control the bleeding, if you can understand these tumors that they will never transgress the dura here or dura here or dura here, completely within the cavernous sinus, you can remove this. I removed this long time ago and I published and here the aneurysm also has been clipped. This is another tumor, never it will transgress or violate the dural confines and these tumors are most benign tumor. As soon as you remove this tumor, the headache is gone and the person returns back to normal life. I have the video here, but you know, because I have only 90 minutes to show you this uh, whole presentation. So this is first thing for an extradural. This is the posterior, this is anterior. First thing is cut the meningeal artery, super, uh, middle meningeal artery, and then you can do extradural approach. Then what you have to do, peel off the dura. You have to know how to coagulate and when not to coagulate. Many of these tumors, you know, even if they are vascular, you cannot go on coagulating and coagulating because if you go on coagulating, you will never end. The surgery will never end. And this peeling, you see the peeling of cavernous sinus wall is a very effective way to open the lateral wall of cavernous sinus. And then to, you see with how I'm doing blunt dissection to expose the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, which is still encasing the fifth cranial nerve dura. And the entire lateral wall can be exposed for this very, very heavily vascular tumor. And now once you have exposed the lateral wall completely, you have to expose for these tumors. You know, exposure is a very key thing for any operation. And for this operation, you don't have to open the brain. You don't have to come intra. So this is the V2, this is the V1. I'm trying to expose You see how it is bleeding this tumor. You cannot actually, if you, you know, and this, I have to tell you that I am, this, the whole operation is almost non-edited. And, uh, I do many of these cases in a very, you see, you see the red colored tumor. First thing that you have to go is to get to the sixth nerve that you have got here. Identify the sixth nerve, save the sixth nerve and isolate the sixth nerve and then go further in the dissection. And once you remove the tumor, once you have, you get a very panoramic and things like that. This is, a, this is a very doable operation. It will bleed and it will bleed furiously and you have to get ready for that. Now I will go for, for a very common subject that we all deal, giant pituitary tumors and pituitary tumors. I have to say that our information of Dura has completely, completely revolutionized pituitary tumor surgery and I will show you how. And there are several articles of mine in various books and various journals. You, I will invite you to read these articles. And these articles, I'm going to show you how 
the concept of dura has completely revolutionized this common subject of pituitary tumor surgery. These are giant pituitary tumors. They have a very defined dural, under, dural relationship, which I am going to show you. These giant tumor, they have madness, but there is a method in this madness, which I'm going to show you. I divided pituitary tumors into four grades. Now you carefully look at these slides. I said for the first time in the literature that the diaphragm celli is elevated by the tumor and diaphragm celli, the dura of the diaphragm celli is not transgressed by the pituitary tumor in most cases, in grade one tumors. This understanding that the dura is elevated has completely revolutionized pituitary tumor surgery. Whether you use endoscope or microscope, that is a different, minuscule thing. Dura is elevated by the pituitary tumor, so you operate here, 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 you remove the tumor, dura will ultimately come into the field. This concept I introduced in the year 1992 or 93, and there is no question this concept has completely changed how to do pituitary tumor surgery. You will not imagine majority of these tumors in the 1995 or 94 during that time, all of these tumors were done transcranially. Dura is preserved and even is there is a nubbin of dura around this part of the tumor, it is not transgressed. This kind of configuration, it is the dura is preserved and is not transgressed, is a very important information. Is dura is going inside the brainstem, but this dura demarcates the tumor from the brainstem. This information is very critical. Grade two tumor is when the tumor goes in the cavernous sinus, the lateral wall of dura is preserved. The diaphragm is preserved. These are grade two tumors. Grade one tumors are less aggressive than grade two tumors. Dura of the lateral wall is preserved and the tumor goes in both cavernous sinus. How some tumor go in cavernous sinus and why some tumors do not go into cavernous sinus is a matter of discussion. And we have published on this, the medial wall of cavernous sinus is a great wall, almost an impermeable wall, but some people have the how to enter into the Great Wall, like Great Wall of China. Some people knew how to transgress the Great Wall of China. So this tumor has that power to transgress. So grade two and grade three, carefully look at these slides. This tumor has gone into cavernous sinus. This tumor has elevated the dural roof of the cavernous sinus. It is still within the cavernous sinus. You must remember it is still within the confines of the dura. Dura is elevated but it is not transgressed. Diaphragm is elevated, dural roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated, lateral wall is displaced, not transgressed. Beautiful. For the first time in the literature, we mentioned that the dural roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated by these tumors. These tumors I call grade three. Grade three tumors are more aggressive than grade two tumors. Dural roof of the cavernous sinus, diaphragm of the, cav diaphragm of the cella, and dural roof of the cavernous sinus, beautiful trifoliate tumor. It is very rare that the dura of the cavernous, dura of the diaphragm is transgressed by these tumors and in circle of villus is encased. If you have this information, you can do pituitary tumor surgery without going transcranial and you can do a beautiful job and an extremely quick job. I must tell you that many of these tumors I do in 20 minutes or 30 minutes operation and it's possible. And it is not uh, too much to say that this tumor is quite a rather simple tumor. If you know one thing and that thing is that the dura is intact. If you know one thing that the dura is intact, this information is quite critical dural roof of the cavernous sinus. This understanding has completely, as I have repeatedly mentioned, quite an influence on the way we operate pituitary tumors today. So this tumor, you don't have to remove the planum spinardale or tuberculum celli. 
you have to just remove the anti wall of the cell, break into the tumor. These are soft tumors. You break into the tumor and debulk the tumor and under, you know the art. You have to know how to do it. You have to learn how to do in bleeding territory and the whole diaphragm will come into the picture and the tumor is gone and the patient gets a new life, a new vision for his life and a new way how to live. These tumors are like this, this uterus. Uterus is the strongest muscle of the body. You'd never have to do cesarean section. You should not do. No animal, no elephant, no donkey has ever undergone a cesarean section. It is only a donkey of a human person who prefers to do cesarean section for this beautiful and ignores the powers of the uterus. Similarly, for these kind of tumors with pregnant baby, there is no need to come transcranial. This is a real time, quick operation, soft tumors with necrosis, and you can have a beautiful outcome in a very quick time. These tumors have, there is subfrontal extension was the indication for transcranial surgery at that time. I have to tell you under no circumstance, this tumor should be removed by transcranial route. Even this kind of extension, no need to come from here. No need to come from here. Just remove this anterior wall and start breaking the tumor, breaking the tumor. And you have to know that art, how to do and break the tumor. You can imagine in 2001, I did this tumor 20 years ago. You see this diaphragm cell is with the information that diaphragm is going to be present. I did this tumor in 2001 and gave a new life to this person in the immediate post-operative period. He said, doctor, what a fantastic vision I have got and what a fantastic doctor he was seeing. This was another case I did in 1999, 21 years ago. You see, this was the tumor, the information if you had that this tumor is within the dural confines. I removed this tumor, this is immediate post-operative scan where there is a lot of blood, but this patient, this post-operative blood will always be there in such large tumors. But this patient was a young man and I removed it completely by just removing the anterior wall. Cavernous sinus extension for pituitary tumors which extend like this, you have to follow the tumors, you have to follow many of these non-functioning tumors, you don't have to remove from in the intracavernous portion, but functioning tumor, of course, you have to remove. Transphenoidal, trans, you have to know how to enter into cavernous sinus. Some tumors are, many of these tumors are soft. Many of these tumors have to be removed, <clears throat> like Cushing disease, acromegaly, cannot be controlled unless you remove the cavernous sinus portion of the tumor. So this is the elevation of the roof of cavernous sinus. When you remove this, when you have this residue, these tumors are very prone to recurrence. So this understanding that the dural roof of the cavernous sinus is elevated, you can remove this tumor. In 2002, I removed. So understanding of the dural configuration is critical. And this kind of tumor, which is grade four tumor, encases the artery of circle of villus, you have to have a different attitude of surgery. Now I go to another tumor, which is my favorite tumor. I described this 73 cases in 2003. Now my experience is nearing 300, which is the largest experience in the world. This article showed that the tumor, this article showed for the first time in the literature, that these tumors arises from the Meckel scale, first thing. Second thing in this article, which is very heavily cited article, showed that the sensations of the trigeminal nerve can be preserved in trigeminal neuronoma surgery, first time in the literature, as a series. There were some isolated reports, but never as a series. And also for the first time in the literature, we showed that this part interdural between the layers of the dura and understanding this mechanism or this relationship completely revolutionized trigeminal neuronoma surgery. In the year 2003, I said that this part of the tumor is subarachnoid like acoustic, but then we said subsequently 
that even this part of the tumor is can be intradural in location. So we did this operation in 1995, 25 years ago, infratemporal fossa, intradural approach. During that time, I must tell you, cavernous sinus surgery was very difficult and dangerous and very few people, even today it is difficult and dangerous and even today very few people are doing. But in 1995, I did trigeminal neuronoma surgery by intradural approach, infratemporal fossa, without doing any craniotomy. So this was the first time the cavernous sinus surgery was done without craniotomy. So this, in my paper, this was one tumor which was done without craniotomy. And this was another tumor which was going in the posterior fossa like this. And I removed without craniotomy with just opening the foramen ovale and widening it. So this was another case I did without opening the skull. So these tumors, trigeminal, are uh, intradural tumor, this understanding completely revolutionized uh, trigeminal neuronoma surgery. And many of these tumors, believe me, I do in very quick time, I should not say 20 minutes or half an hour, but not more than one hour, this operation can be and should be done. Before we described, many of these tumors were done in two stage and two-stage operations were very commonly done during those times. And in 1991, I used to do two-stage operations. So I did first middle fossa and then posterior fossa, two-stage in 1991. 1992, I did this case two-stage. First, I removed this and then I removed this. But then as our understanding increased and our base uh, understanding of skull base, in general increased and improved. And then we understand, understood the dural configuration. Then I started doing this basal work, removal of root of zygoma, removal of roof of condyle, roof of external ear canal, partial mastorectomy. I used to do these kind of exposures I described in 1996, but then I reduced my exposure. Just, this was is my current, just splitting the temporalis muscle, working, small craniotomy here, go extradural, intradural, and you can remove these tumors, as I mentioned, in very quick time, if you learn how to respect the dura, learn how to break the, demolishing the tumor. If you know how to demolish without much coagulation, you can save the fifth nerve fibers in a very beautiful manner on a consistent basis. I will say today, that if your facial sensations are gone following trigeminal neuronoma surgery, you have done great harm to the patient in general. You cannot have a patient losing his corneal sensation after surgery, and you have to know how to work within the dura and how to demolish this tumor in a very quick fashion and in a very judicious fashion, in a respectful fashion to the dura and to the carotid artery will always be displaced by the dura. You don't have to have proximal control. And even when the tumors go extracranial, this is V1, V2, V3, the dural configuration is always present. We described this dural configuration in, 19, in 2010 and on the basis of 28 cases, extracranial extension. And we described a transcranial route to remove these extracranial tumors, which was reverse skull based tumors, uh, reverse skull based approach. Similar to gasserian ganglion tumor, trigeminal nerve tumor arises from the gasserian ganglion, which is the largest ganglion in the body. Similarly, C2 ganglion is the largest ganglion in the spine. C2 ganglion is unique that is extra spinal it is outside the spine behind the c1 c2 joint it is between the dura it a tumor arises c2 nerve tumor arises in the ganglion and it is between the dural layer so we describe this is c2 neuronoma like trigeminal neuronoma between the dura and i had described first that this is intradural and this is intradural on the basis of an experience with 60 cases in 2008, I said that this is intradural. This is intradural. But in 2018, I described additional 50 cases. I said that even this part is intradural in location. And believe me, this concept has completely changed my personal dealing with these tumors and uh, the rapidity of performing of these operations. 
So this is a C2 neuronoma, trigeminal neuronoma, work within the dura, work within the dura, and you can do these operations in a very quick time. Now I want to take you to third nerve neuronoma. Third nerve neuronoma are dangerous looking tumors. You see dangerous looking, but I will give you one magic, how to remove third nerve neuronoma with the concept that the dura is present around these tumors. This we published sometime, some several years ago, that oculomotor nerve tumor arises from the oculomotor cistern and the dura is, it takes the dura along with, it is not the capsule of the tumor, but this is the dura. Work within the dura, demolish the tumor, learn the art of breaking the tumor, and you can save the third nerve and improve the third nerve function after the surgery. First time in the literature, this origin has been mentioned and this concept of preserving the third nerve has been mentioned. Dura is present around the third nerve. Break the tumor, but preserve the fibers around the caps, uh, inside the dome of the tumor. This is sixth nerve tumor, which is the most unique tumor. And I'm still trying to analyze the dural relationship of the sixth nerve tumor. Similarly, seven nerve, these are very complex skull-based tumors. This is seven nerve neuronoma. If you do not know the dural confines of this tumor, if you do not know how these tumors originate, this tumor arises from the geniculate ganglion and they remo remain entirely, whether they go in posterior fossa or in the middle fossa, interdural in location. I can tell you several of these cases can be done in less than one hour is too long an operation. But work within the dura, try to save the fibers of the seventh nerve, which go on the medial aspect towards the petrous apex and in its course towards the mastoid bone. You can preserve and improve the facial nerve function. This is what we describe for the first time in the literature, interdural approach, respect the dura, respect dura matter, respect dura mother. Another beautiful thing I really recently described, interdural approach to lower cranial nerve schwannomas. So we described that lower cranial nerve schwannomas arise within the jugular foramen and they retain the dura around its com complete entirety. Even extradural part is within the dura. And if you respect the dura, you can save the lower cranial nerve and you can improve the function of the cranial nerve following surgery. This is the trick. If you do not know, if you try to remove it as a capsule, then you completely demolish the lower cranial nerve in certainly, but you can certainly preserve and improve the lower cranial nerve function if you know how to preserve the dura. Another beautiful and common tumor of the, for the skull-based surgeon is a clival cordoma. These tumors we described that these are entirely extradural for the first time in the literature. We described that these are tumor which demolish the bone but displace the soft tissues for the first time in the literature. They displace the carotid artery anteriorly. They displace the cavernous sinus superiorly. This concept makes your surgery very beautiful and philosophical. You see, when you come from lateral, there is no carotid artery here, no cranial nerve here and you can come from this direction and there is no brainstem here, no basilar artery here, if you know how to respect the dura. Carotid artery is displaced anteriorly by the tumor I described in 1995. And believe me, this is one of the most fascinating papers of mine that the dura is displaced posteriorly and the cavernous sinus is displaced superiorly. On the basis of these concepts, I described middle fossa sub ganglion approach to clival cordoma, beautiful approach, most philosophical approach I described in 1995. Come from lateral, artery is anteriorly dislocated, cavernous sinus is superiorly dislocated, basilar artery is posteriorly located, protected by the dura. You see this tumor looks horrendous and difficult. Carotid artery is anterior, dura is here. You can come and work within the dura and you can remove this tumor beautifully in quick time. Recently, I just want to show you, recently I described supracerebellar approach to some clival cordomas. You will never like to do this. But when the tumor comes too much behind, for the first time, beautiful thing we mentioned in this article that the sixth nerve is 
loses its companionship with the carotid artery and traverses on the dome of the tumor. So you can protect the sixth nerve by working in the anterior respect, anterior aspect of this tumor, and you can do by a supracerebellar, supracerebellar approach in some selected. Of course, these are extradural tumors. You have to come extradurally to remove these tumors. But this is one option that you can use supracerebellar for some tumors which are quite in the posterior fossa like this and quite in the clivus like this, you can remove supracellar. Now I want to talk to you about meningiomas. Meningioma is my very favorite subject and I have spent my whole lifetime treating meningiomas. So this was one tumor I removed in 1995. 1995, I removed these tumors. This is cavernous sinus and petroclival cavernous sinus meningioma. I removed a long time ago. And I damaged the patient by having this patient develop hemiplegia following surgery. Young man at that time, he's still alive with hemiparesis. Now he walks with a stiff gait on one side, carotid artery, preservation, safety of cavernous sinus vessels, safety of the cranial nerve is crucial issue that we have to learn and respect. And you cannot do cavernous sinus surgery unless you learn to protect these nerves. So one beautiful editorial I wrote in Journal of Neurosurgery, I would like to invite you to read this editorial, beautiful editorial as to how to deal with cavernous sinus. So I just to give you some philosophical issues about meningiomas involving cavernous sinus. This is a convexity dura based meningioma. This is a benign meningioma I, according to me. When it goes into the superior cycle sinus, it is more aggressive. When it involves the superior cycle sinus, it is more aggressive in its behavior than a convexity meningioma. When it involves the superior cycle sinus and involves the gallia and the bone, it is more aggressive in behavior. When it goes and involves the paranasal sinuses, it becomes nearing malignant nature. When it breaks the bone, goes outside, it is more aggressive in behavior. When it is located in paranasal sinuses, it is almost like a malignancy. Similarly, when the tumor is on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, it is like convexity dura based meningioma. When it goes inside the cavernous sinus, it is inherently more aggressive in nature. So this meningioma, which is on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus is less aggressive. When it goes inside the cavernous sinus, and it is outside, it is inherently more aggressive. I'm not saying it is malignant, but it is more aggressive. We should have that information in our mind. And when it goes and involves the sphenoid sinus, it is much more aggressive in nature. Purely intracavernous meningioma are more aggressive than tumors arising from the lateral wall. I removed this tumor in 1995. There was a recurrence in 2001. This tumor is more aggressive because it is going into the paranasal sinuses. You must remember that we are do dealing with a tumor which is nearing malignancy. And without question, when the tumor goes and involves the eyeball like this, it is a malignant tumor, even if it is a meningioma by name. So these tumors which arises from the lateral wall are relatively, I should not say easy or straightforward. These are good tumors to operate and behaviorally they are much better than a tumor which goes inside the cavernous sinus. So these tumors are better. So this tumor arises meningioma from the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus. This is post-operative. I had removed several years ago and complete this patient is a custom officer and still working with no problem at all. This are relatively straightforward. When the tumor goes into cavernous sinus, it becomes more tricky. But tricky means it is not that we will not go into cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus. You have to follow the tumor as long as you can be safe. As long as you can say, I will preserve the cranial nerves. If you damage the extraocular movement, it is as good as damaging the complete eye. I'm not saying you cannot damage. We, I have damaged several oculomotor nerves, several six nerves in my career, but it is a complication. And you have to learn to handle those complications and most importantly, learn to avoid those complications. Posterior clinoid meningiomas are more 
beautiful tumors than tumors which go inside the cavernous sinus. So this is one pitoclival meningioma. A small part of the tumor was left behind in the cavernous sinus, leaving behind cavernous sinus tumor is not a bad thing. But if you can remove, it is better. But if you cannot remove, it is not a, it is not a crime. I will say to be philosophically understand this a lot of tumor behind. And I wanted to do second stage, but this patient was completely asymptomatic for a long time, still asymptomatic for several years after surgery. You have to know when to remove and how to follow the tumor is one thing and how to follow the symptoms is another thing. I used to do very aggressive tumor bone work, mobilization of the facial nerve, mobilization of the carotid artery. There are several articles of mine where I remove, I move the facial nerve, cut the GSP and mobilize the nerve and do very aggressive exposures. This tumor I did long time ago with very aggressive exposure, <clears throat> but now my exposures have become less. This see this tumor and post-operative scan. But my, for several, now I'm not saying for, for several petroclival meningioma, I like to do a relatively less aggressive exposure by supracerebellar approach. I have now got several cases. I described 28 cases in 2004. Now I think I must be having more than 150 or more cases I did with supracerebellar approach. Beautiful approach for several of these tumors. Even when the tumor goes up, you can remove this tumor by supracerebellar, goes towards the cavernous sinus, you can try to remove and you from a very selective, you see this tumor in the cavernous sinus, you can come in this direction and remove this tumor. I'm not saying you can do it all the time, you may not be able to remove, but you have to have an, you have to have that feel that yes, I have to remove this tumor. This is pitoclival removed by supracerebellar. This is the same case. I showed you earlier, this is the tumor going in the cavernous sinus removed by supracerebellar in very quick time. I must tell you, I, in neurosurgery, that is one thing you should never say that I do in quick time and I do quickly. That is the last thing in your mind. But with your experience, with your ability to work within the dura, with the ability to respect the dura, with the ability to understand that you don't have to completely clear off if some tumor is left here and there. It is not, not bad. But your attitude should not be bad. Your attitude should be towards radical complete resection. And you can remove several of these tumors in very quick time. And this is the preoperative and this is the postoperative image. This is the removed in very quick time. Pitoclival meningioma, just to show you a brief video of this. This is the post-operative showing the cranial nerves and things after this radical tumor resection. This is another, this is pre-operative and some tumor was left behind in the cavernous sinus. This is the, uh, just I want to, I don't want to show you too much dissection here, but showing you the complete resection of this tumor possible with the supracellar. Just I want to introduce to young people supracerebellar approach to these kind of very complex tumors, which can be done in very quick time and have a very big, huge exposure. And uh, as I have mentioned now, on several occasions, I do this supracerebellar and a very fantastic exposure is possible. Just quickly show you the end of this operation as to how I am exposing the basilar artery and the vertebral basilar complex. And uh, this is the, of course, the terminal stage of the operation. Now I want to briefly, just briefly touch on various meningiomas. This is I, uh, tuberculum celli meningioma I described in 2000, uh, 270 cases. Now my experience is the largest in the world, more than 300 cases olfactory group, this was the largest series ever published in the literature. And foramen magnum also, this minimal reduction, you see how I have reduced in 2001, I showed that you can do midline posterior approach for these tumors, even located anteriorly, you can do quick. Even the most complex foramen magnum, 
ossified foramen magnum meningioma. Let me show you some ossified tumor. This is bone tumor located anteriorly, bony tumor. Encasing the vertebral artery, you, I did by midline posterior approach this complete resection. Dangerous tumor. You see this bony tumor encasing both vertebral arteries and I have done by posterior midline approach for this complex tumor. This is another bony tumor. You see bone encasing the, encasing the vertebral artery. This is post-operative. So what I want to show you is that as you learn, as you grow, with more experience, should, you should know the art of demolishing the tumor, that is one. You should know the anatomy of the tumor, that is two. You should know the dura relationship of the tumor and how these tumors will respect the dura and how you have to work in the, in the membranes. Beautiful three sentences I want to give you regarding meningioma. That Curing, you can never cure. You do whatever Simpson and whatever zero Simpson or minus zero symptom Simpson, but you can never cure. So curing is non-issue in the treatment of meningioma. Recurrence of meningioma is independent of extent of tumor resection. It is not the treatment, but the cellular behavior of the meningioma that decides the outcome. Extra, this nasopharyngeal tumor, just I want to touch. Nasopharyngeal tumors are outside the dura and outside the skull. Nasopharyngeal angiofibroma should be removed from the nose or mid-facial degloving operation is a good operation. These are extradural and extracranial tumors. I had described transcranial route for the first time for nasopharyngeal angiofibromas, but I will, in 1994, but I will not recommend it. I like to do mid-facial degloving. Epidermoid tumors are also very membrane friendly tumors they remain in selected group of membranes and i have got several epidermoid tumors of the cavernous sinus aspergilloma can sometimes be mistaken as a meningioma this i had published several years ago on two cases but i have got several cases of aspergilloma i have got mucos various other fungus this is tuberculoma involving the cavernous sinus Reconstruction after skull-based surgery is a very important thing. You should know the membranes of the scalp and membranes of the skin and membranes of the dura. I had described the subgallial fascia as an additional layer and there are several articles of mine discussing vascularized pedicle reconstruction. You must, you can, I have got some 12 or 13 flaps which I have described, you must read if you are interested to read this reconstruction. Vascularized reconstruction using vascularized mucosal flap was described in this article. Uh, how to use outer layer of the dura as a pedicle flap. Recently we described another with my associate. We have described another layer. So in short, we must remember that we are not gods. We are human beings. We are but we can become better human beings by changing our attitudes, by respecting our seniors, respecting our mother, respecting our teachers, respecting our tumors who are our teachers. Tumors teach us. Tumors give us messages. And neurosurgery, one day we are very high. The next day we can be extremely low. <clears throat> we can create a complication out of nothing. Every neurosurgeon should have a plaque in front of his clinic stating that there are some patients whom we cannot help. There are none whom we cannot harm. Thank you very much, my dear friends. I hope you have got some wonderful messages from this lecture. Thank you very much. So over to you, Sanjeeva. So thank you for, again, absolutely fantastic. Uh, presentation, a real tour de force uh, of the cavernous sinus. Thank, thank you. I'm just going to ask one question while I look through what uh, the questions that I'm sure are coming through for everyone. What would you recommend at all as some, for someone who is starting out in cavernous sinus surgery? <laughs> See, cavernous sinus surgery is not for starting out people. Indeed. You have to start out one day. Someday you have to start out. But you have to start out after a proper infrastructure. Building has 
to be made, you cannot jump and start making the doors and windows of the, for the cavernous sinus surgery. You have to make a foundation first. You have to build the, dig the ground. You have to make the foundation. You have to dig, you have to learn the anatomy. You have to learn anatomy several times over. And you have to have the experience of dealing with several brain tumors, several extradural tumors, several intradural tumors, convex tree meningiomas. Once you are ready, you are ready. You have to come with a bang. You cannot say, I will start cavernous sinus surgery first day. But you have to learn and you, you have to be junior and you have to develop and progress and you have to become big. You have to mature into cavernous sinus surgery slowly, surely, but definitely. I think that's very well put, not all, very well put. John, I see you've come up on the screen. Are there any questions from our participants or Professor Gore or all of any of the panelists? Please type when your questions in. John has come, it means it is time to wrap up the show. John, There's one come. question here. Oh, no, no, I'm not coming. Up. Anyone can ask a question. What are, the, okay. ask what are the top three tips for debulking a tumor? I think you made a very nice point there, Tool, about, you know, everybody talks about the beautiful arachnoidal dissection. We talk a lot about the drilling and all of that, but actually, a big part of doing these sort of operations in difficult areas is really getting the volume down, isn't it? What are your tips My for tip relaxing is, the brain, what, getting the tumor uh, down? Tip is learn to assess the quality of the tumor, whether they are soft tumor, whether they are firm tumor, whether they are necrotic tumor, whether they are vascular tumor. You learn to demolish the tumor. If you if you if your art of demolishing the tumor is by coagulation and continuous bipolaring. Many a time you can spend hours and hours without moving an inch ahead. You have to learn to break the tumor and coagulate at specific targeted points rather than all over. As soon as it bleeds, you know, many of these tumors, like I was talking about cavernous hemangioma of cavernous sinus. If your, if your, attitude, if your attitude, attitude is to have a clean field, if your attitude is to have a bloodless field, you can never do these tumors. You, can, you don't even go near these tumors because you can never do that. Mm. You will not believe, but many of these tumors, like P2T tumor, giant P2T tumors, there is no coagulation on my operation table. Many of these trigeminal neuronomas, I coagulate hardly during the operation. There is, you can remove the entire tumor without a single coagulation during the operation. Here and there, some meningeal vessel bleeding and you can do. Basically, it is not, I am not stressing on the time factor that you do quickly or do rapidly. That is the last thing in my mind. But if you have the art of breaking into the tumor and uh, you know, you can do quickly, you can do safely and you can protect the cranial nerves which are hovering around your field, surgery field, like trigeminal nerves. I said, you have to save the trigeminal sensation. You have to save the V1, and you, if you, have, if you uh, don't save the V1, there is a complication at hand. Extra, uh, oculomotor nerve, if you do not save the oculomotor, I'm not saying you can save oculomotor nerve in all meningioma, you can save the six nerve in all pitocliver. Don't get me wrong, but our aim of surgery should be saving these nerves all the time. And if you say, I have removed the tumor completely, and I cut the third nerve because my tumor was not being resected. That is, the, that is a very wrong understanding of philosophical understanding of the tumor. That is a message. That is why I say that total tumor resection and curing is not the aim of the operation. Radical surgery is the aim. You remove from your mind that if you remove it totally, the, you have cured the person. That is out of your mind. Like acoustic tumor, you have to keep in your mind that acoustic tumor, once there is acoustic tumor, it is always an acoustic tumor. You cannot cure the person of acoustic tumor. If you say, I have, done, I have cut the facial nerve because I wanted to cure the person, there is no attitude worse than that. You have to save yeah. the facial nerve and you have to leave some tumor. In giant tumor, I give one message to the young people. In large tumors, more than three centimeters, if you say, I have removed the tumor completely zero, I have left all the tumor out 
you are saying lies. You can never remove the tumor completely in a tumor which is more than three centimeter and you can save the facial. You leave some tumor behind on the facial now. Always, you keep that attitude in your mind that I will leave a sleeve. If you say I will do partial resection and all those things, that is, you will come out with 20% resection. You have to be aggressive in these tumors, but you should not be, you should be kind to the facial now and to the patient because the identity of the patient depends. And you say, I will remove the tumor completely. That is absolutely ridiculous way of thinking. Sanjeeva, what is your message on this? <laughs> no, I agree 100%. I think you have to leave a tiny, particularly at the pore, and we're going off topic a bit on acoustics, but you're right, particularly at the porous, <clears throat> the nerve really starts to thin. Uh, you usually have to leave a small amount. I agree fully. I want to come back to the bulky, but I also want to bring our panelists in. So maybe I'll ask uh, Professor Sanford about what his views on, he's talked about Tissil, uh, and maybe you can, and you and uh, Abira could comment too. Um, hemostasis while working in the cavernous sinuses is, is critical, isn't it? It's about understanding there are pockets of these venous sinuses and that you can control that and work in different locations. But maybe we'll ask Sanford first, Atul, and then we'll come back to you. Sanford, what are your tips for controlling hemostasis in the cavernous sinus? No, oh, he might not be here. Atul, why don't you start us off? I what are don't, your tips? Uh, you know, I don't like to seal or any artificial thing, tell you the truth. I don't want to say you are wrong. I don't want to oh, say yeah. uh, you, are, you should not do. But I, if you are asking me, I have to tell you what I am doing. I don't do these things. And I don't believe in putting T-seal and artificial material. I put some surgical here, surgical there. You know what? You have to know what to use at what time. When to use coagulation. When to avoid any kind of coagulation or anything. When to use bone wax. When to use surgical. When to use gel foam. When to use pressure. These form these things form the basis of neurosurgery. These things form the basis of our entire life of tumor surgery and of our neurosurgery. And we have to learn as we go progress further and further and further in our life and in our career of neurosurgery, we know how to handle because one person, one neurosurgeon is different in the attitude towards bleeding as regards another neurosurgeon. One neurosurgeon, if the bleeding starts, he will shake and he will be terrified. Other person will be cool and composed. It is not just the attitude. One, bleeding, one person will start, take bipolar in the hand and keep on burning, burning, burning all over the place. Other person will do another attitude. So how I differentiate one neurosurgeon from the other is his response to bleeding. Is his attitude, attitude when the bleeding occurs, what attitude he changes and he adopts. That is what makes one surgeon different from the other and in the entire field of neurosurgery. I don't use this. So, so you would favor a surgery cell or as you say, you have to make progress sometimes in these cases. Is Sanford still on this call? Are we, Professor Sue, are you still here? Can we unmute? John, can you tell me, is he still here? He looks like he's still here. He might just be just out of the room. No, what are you looking for? Uh, Sanford. He, he, he is here, but uh, he is muted. I think he, uh, he may, be, uh, may be out and left. To the, because okay, uh, it's too late uh, for him. No, absolutely, absolutely. It's very good for him to join us so late. Okay. Um, okay, well, maybe we'll take one more question and then we can, we can come to a close. It's been an ex excellent session. Obviously, with the length of time, it'll be affecting some of our participants who are in different parts of the world. So we'll take a question here from Gianluca Grimaud. Uh, well, this will be interesting, Atul, what you have to say about this. Uh, this is something we use in Oxford. The question is, would you recommend radiosurgery for, for certain cavernous sinus meningiomas? What is your view on that, Otto? Yeah, that is a, a difficult view to... But I will say, I will invite this person who is asking this question to read my editorial, which I had placed on the screen during my lecture on cavernous sinus meningioma. I will invite him to read. 
So in short, my attitude towards using of radiation is as long as I think my knife can work, as long as I think my knife can reach the tumor and I can remove the tumor, I will use my knife. But as soon as I think that using of knife can be dangerous for the patient and I cannot reach with my knife, I will say radiation. And if I leave some small radiation, uh, residue behind, I will never like to give radi radiation unless I see a definite recurrence, which I will not be able to reach with my knife. So knife first, gamma knife last, or maybe as a rescue mission, but never as a upfront, never. That is my so answer. As long as you feel opinion. you can safely remove the tumor. That's right, that's right. You Safety would, uh, first. Yeah. And you know, in uh, Sanjeeva, you can understand in neurosurgery, heroism is not a good word. Heroics will not work. Ego and pride will not work. It is good to be proud, but never have pride on your shoulder. And you know, you can be, you can never go beyond a line. You have to work with your head down, with your feet firmly implanted on the ground. You have to work with heads down with respect to the nature, respect to the tumor biology, respect to the patient's needs. You can never start heroics. You know what? Just because, you know, a few days ago was the Hiroshima bombing day. And the one who designed the bombing, bomb, who made the bomb, Oppenheimer, I cannot pronounce that pro properly. He said that it was a technical wonder, but whether this technical wonder that killed so many people on the planet, whether that technical wonder was good enough, whether it was good at all. These were the words of this great man who made the atom bomb. Similarly, sometimes we do technically to make, give a good pre-operative and post-operative picture. I show here is the pre-op and here is the post-op but I don't show you the patient will hemiparesis or patient will third nerve or the patient will devastation of the face. You know, it is not the technical heroism which matters. It is the result that matters in our mm -hmm. subject, in our great subject of neurosurgery. Uh, you're absolutely right, Atul. I think that's a, a, a beautiful note to finish on and uh, something for all of us to think about uh, during our career. So thank you very much. I think the person we really must also thank is Dr. Same, who's lined up an absolutely fantastic lineup of speakers. So Dr. Same, well, well done. You've invited world-class speakers. It's been a fantastic session. I've learned a lot. I hope everybody uh, joining us today has also learned a lot. Just to run through again for you, we had beautiful, beautiful dissections at the start uh, from Dr. Abiha, and then we moved on uh, to Professor Sanford showing some very complex great systematic approach uh, to working through building up your skills and then finally the tour de force uh, from Professor Gold. Very impressive lectures, all three of them, beautiful lectures. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to join you today. As I said, I've learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. And Dr. Same, well done. It's a lot of hard work. Thank, thank you, thank you, you Sanjeeva. One thing I must tell you that you live, you are working in Oxford, which is the of uh, entire, you know, we are waiting for the vaccine to come from your center. And I hope the Oxford vaccine will kill the corona and make us all strong and able to handle the corona. So you're working in the center which is making the vaccine. And I'm sure you are doing some remarkable and wonderful neurosurgery. I look forward to visiting your center. And, and like you, I thank Dr. Sameh, who is um, building up this huge power force of neurosurgical uh, encyclopedia and neurosurgical force. There is no question, you know, this uh, symposium is being watched by so many people other than what you see the numbers on the screen. Dr. Sameh, you will Thank you. slowly and surely build a great university of neurosurgery. My best wishes to you, Dr. Sameh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhay. That's well said. Thank, thank you, dear uh, Professor, for attendance and great lectures that you have honored us and thanks uh, Professor uh, Sanjeeva for uh, amazing uh, amazing uh, moderation for such a great uh, session. Uh, last announcement uh, for all panelists and uh, professors and attendees 
uh, wait for us for the next session. It will be uh, 4th and 5th September at the same time of uh, this lecture. Keep the date and the links will be available on main group of Evans Academy. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, see Atul. <laughs> see you soon, John. You're the best, Atul. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you all of that. Thank you. Thank bye you very bye. much. Can I, can, I have, can I have a small comment, please? Yes.